But sometimes there are psalms that go together. 22, 23, 24 are such an occurrence. So we just read, sang an updated version of Psalm 23. Now let's pray Psalm 24 together. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? They will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Lift up your heads, your gates, be lifted up, your ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Lift up your gates, your heads, lift them up, your ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Amen.
Everybody say a prayer for Eben's pack. To that end of um, praising our Lord, the Almighty, um, I just wanted to give us a little space to reflect on Easter. Um, and so most of us celebrated Easter about two weeks ago on Sunday, um, and the Orthodox Church is celebrating Easter in about three weeks on May 5th. Um, but that means that currently we are in the middle of Eastertide, which is the season of about 50 days um, after the day of Jesus's resurrection. 
um, and it lasts until the Feast of Pentecost. Um, and so since we spend, you know, those 40 days of Lent preparing our hearts for Easter, the Resurrection Day, um, I kind of wanted to give us a chance to sit in the, in the joy and wonder of Jesus' resurrection um, during this next 50 days of the season. Um, and so I was talking about this with a very dear friend of mine, um, and we just wanted to, yeah, create that space for reflection and sitting back in that realization that um, the risen God is for us and he is present with us um, even when we don't know that. So um, I would like to welcome a beloved Westmont community member and my friend Christy Phillips. Hello friends, it's an honor to share this with you, so thank you for letting me be here. Um, just for some context, I spent most of my years of college wrestling a lot with the darkness and the suffering in the world um, and processing that through poetry, and so come Holy Week each year, I feel like I would fixate a lot on the crucifixion and how that makes space in the story of Christianity for our suffering, and that was something that I really held on to. Um, but since this past Palm Sunday and kind of um, through Holy Week and into Eastertide this time around, I feel like I've just been really struck by how all of those really dark moments and the things, uh, the, the suffering that I was grieving and bringing to God in prayer, um, I'm seeing and real, I've been realizing that there's just been this slow and gentle healing and redemptive process in so many of those strands of the story that were so painful at the time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily in one big dramatic moment that I feel like God redeemed these things in my life that felt um, dead or dying, um, but it was just this sort of sweet and almost stealthy movement of the Holy Spirit in my life and in the lives of the people that are most dear to my heart. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about that and also how most of, in the story of the resurrection, most of the disciples actually like, they're not there for the moment when the earth quakes and when the stone is rolled away. That all happens presumably while they're sleeping and then they discover the next morning. Um, yeah, so I was relating to the story of especially the disciples on Emmaus Road um, who are literally talking with Jesus and he's already there and it takes them a while to <laughs> figure out that he's around. And I just think, yeah, I'm looking back at my life and seeing, wow, he has been slowly redeeming these things and walking with me and I didn't even realize it. So that's what this poem is kind of exploring. Resurrection dawning. Exhausted in our pain, we corpses sleep through quaking earth and stones rolled from our tombs. The gentle light of early morning creeps into our blackened world and wakes the blooms of hope. Along the warm spring road we walk and call to mind all kinds of suffering. A pilgrim joins us quietly as we talk and seems to heal us with his listening. The living word himself speaks, drawing near. We slow of heart, blink blindly at his face. The sun of righteousness is risen here. Our hearts are burning with the flames of grace. And as we sit at table, breaking bread, at last we see he's waked us from the dead. Well, I'm excited to introduce our speaker this morning. The first thing I want to say is he Trey, you might have the coolest name I know, Trey Clark. What can't you do with that name? I mean, you could be a sax player, a shortstop, but you've chosen the higher path. Trey is an assistant professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, or as we like to say, God's Seminary, where he teaches in the areas of preaching and spiritual formation. An ordained minister, he serves on the pastoral staff of his local church and enjoys walking alongside others as a spiritual companion. He's also the author of a forthcoming book entitled Black Contemplative Preaching, A Hidden History of Prayer, Proclamation, and Prophetic Witness. So keep your eye out for that. He's also a fellow at Martin Institute's Cultura Fellowship, and we're very grateful 
to have him here with us today. It's been a long time coming. Thank you for being with us, Trey Clark. Well, good morning, Westmont. My heart is full this morning. It's really a privilege to be with you all. I want to say thank you to Scott and to Eben and Mariah and others who uh, had a role in bringing me here. It's really a privilege. Uh, I also have to give a shout out to my wife and daughter who are in the hotel room right now. My daughter came down with a cough, and so uh, she wasn't able to make it. But Kalia, I hope you enjoy watching online. <laughs> Would you join me as we uh, listen to the scripture reading for this morning? We're reading from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Hear these words with me from Jesus in the Gospel of John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it is, unless it is abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear fruit, much fruit, and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then this final verse, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Spirit of the living God, in the midst of many words this morning, by the power of your spirit, may you speak to us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The familiar is passing. The sadness is heavy. And there are some difficult days ahead. It is within this context that the gospel writer situates the words of Jesus. Jesus is giving his farewell address, his last testament, his final words, if you will. And as part of his final words before his departure to his heavenly father, he offers some wisdom to his followers, to his disciples, to his students. And that wisdom, that wisdom can be captured in a single word. Abide. Abide. Let me hear you say abide. abide. Let me hear you say abide. abide. The word abide appears again and again in the Gospel of John. And here in this chapter, chapter 15, it appears 11, over 11 times alone. Abide in me as I abide in you, Jesus says. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide, abide, abide. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, if there's one thing, 
If there is one thing that is crucial, that is essential, that is non-negotiable for the people of God is that they learn how to abide. He's saying that if there's one thing that is crucial to the flourishing, to you entering into the life that is truly life, you have to learn how to abide. And today I want to explore with you the wisdom of abiding. The wisdom of abiding. There's so much in this passage that we could or probably should focus on, but I want to zoom in if it's okay. Is it okay? I just want to zoom in on verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11. And I want to do that asking a few questions. And the first question that I want to consider is, why should we abide in Jesus? I mean, Jesus seems to be making a big deal about abiding. Abide, abide, abide. It's like this broken record. Okay, Jesus, we get it. And I know for some of us, it might be so familiar that we've lost the wisdom, the insight, and the profound gift in these words. Why? Why is Jesus making such a big deal about abiding? Some of us have perhaps almost given up on the whole Jesus thing, but Jesus here speaks about abiding for one crucial reason that I want to focus on, and it's in verse 11. I have said these things to you, Jesus says, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There's many reasons we could say Jesus invites us into a life of abiding, but but one crucial reason is that Jesus cares about our joy. Jesus cares about our joy. He knows that we produce the fruit of whatever we abide in, whatever we remain in, whatever we find ourselves immersed in will shape the fruit that comes out of our life. Jesus invites us to abide in him, to wean us off the fragile joys, the empty joys the hollow joys in our life. And the question he sets before us is, what are you abiding in? What am I abiding in? There's plenty of options for us to abide in in life. Jesus invites us to abide abide in him. There's something about abiding in Jesus this is, this is pretty crazy, but there's something about abiding in Jesus that gives us access to the very joy of God. As a 16th, uh, 6th century Irish monk, Columba of Iona, put it, joy is the echo. Joy is the echo of, the, of God's life in us. Joy is part of the life of God, and the life of God is in us, Jesus says. Now, I've got to clarify a couple things here. And one of those things is that this is not a self-centered joy, right? This is not a joy that's just all about me, myself, and I. Jesus has spoken about how abiding earlier in the passage is connected to the glory of God and the good of others. In other words, the joy of Jesus orients us beyond ourselves. And there's this other dimension. Jesus is speaking to a community, right? He's not just me and Jesus in a room and he's saying, Trey, I've written these things just for your joy. Now, I would love that. But Jesus is speaking to a group here as pictured in his final words. There's something beautiful about this, because I don't know about you, but I've had seasons in my life where I do not sense the joy of Jesus. I can think about a particular time, my junior year of college, was lonely, was isolated, and I was depressed. I was serving in a spiritual leadership position, so I was expected to be this robust, alive, passionate, on-fire leader on our campus. And yet inside, inside I felt like things were falling apart. And yet there was something about the joy of the community around me 
the joy of my sisters and brothers and Christ around me that sustained me in that season. Sometimes we we might not be able to to sense the joy of God, but there is a joy of a community rooted in the life of God that can sustain us, enrich us, and help us to persevere in those dark and difficult times on our journey. This is not a self-centered joy. But there's another thing. This is not a sentimental joy. This is not a hallmark joy. Not, 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 not hating on hallmark, but this is not a hallmark joy. No, no, no. This is not a joy that invites us to turn our back on the difficulties, on the hardships, on the suffering realities of our world. No, Jesus is speaking about joy and has joy in the midst of being surrounded by betrayal. In the midst of being surrounded by the power plays of the religious and political elite, Jesus is speaking about joy in the midst of his impending execution. And if that's not enough, in the rest of the passage, he goes on to speak of the hatred, the tribulation, the suffering, the persecution that his followers were going to encounter. And yet in the midst of all of that, Jesus says, y'all, I want you to know joy is possible in me. This is, a, this is a strange kind of joy, Jesus. This is a, a defiant joy. In the words of theologian Willie Jennings, it is a joy that refuses to give into the forces of despair. The image that often comes to mind for me, it's a little bit of a violent image, but just bear with me. This is joy with boxing gloves on. This is joy that has some fight in it. Joy that refuses to give up when the forces of despair and cynicism seek to snuff out its life. This is a joy that endures through finals week, (laughs) y'all. If you can imagine. A joy that endures through that unexpected breakup. A joy that endures when you get that text or call from home with the news that you never imagined. This is a joy that endures when the tragedy and the pain and the uncertainty of the world almost makes you lose your mind. Jesus says, there is a joy in me that you have access to that lasts, that endures, that fights, that perseveres through it all. If we can only learn, only learn how to abide, this joy can more fully be the reality of our lives. But what does it mean to abide in Jesus? This Greek word for abide, meno, is translated in a variety of ways. Remain, make home, stay connected, and then one of my favorites, stay rooted. Stay rooted. In Jesus' teaching in our passage, he highlights different dimensions of what it means to stay rooted in him. And one of the most basic components of abiding in Jesus, we've already hinted at it, is learning to recognize that Jesus abides in us. To be followers of Jesus is to be connected, connected to God's life like a branch to a vine. Now, of course, there are seasons when there's pruning and we feel disconnected from the divine life. And yet Jesus teaches his disciples, his followers, that in all students, they are in in all seasons, they are indwelt by the very life of God, this mutual indwelling between father and son, we're invited into that. (laughs) I know this is stuff we hear all the time, but this is pretty crazy, y'all. We are invited into it by the Spirit, into the eternal community of love. Now, I got to get an amen on that one, y'all. Come on, come on, come on now. (laughs) Jesus invites us into the very life of God. We are never alone. 
But there's another dimension here to abiding, and that is, I think abiding is not just recognizing that, that Jesus abides in us, but also abiding is learning to relax in God's love. Now, when was the last time that you were fully and completely just relaxed? I mean, really relaxed. I was asked this question not long ago, and I, I kind of had a hard time coming up with an answer. <laughs> I was struck by how rare it is for me to be relaxed. I can be so caught up in cycles of overwork, cycles of comparing myself to others that I just, I don't experience God's gift of relaxing in his unconditional love. In verse 9, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, whew, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Make your home in my love. Stay rooted in my love. Relax in my love. When we learn to abide in Jesus' love, there is no need to panic. There's no need to pretend. The mask can come off in the presence of God's love. When we learn to relax, I mean really relax. I mean just chill in the love of God. When we enter into that, there's no need to perform. My identity, our identity is no longer on the line. One of my favorite images of resting in God's care and love comes from a poem by Denise Levertov, and I love that poem. Christy, I believe. Thank you so much for that beautiful poem. Anybody like poems in the house? I know some of us like poems. Some of us, when we hear poetry, we say, ooh. And others, others of us are like, oh. So with whatever camp you're in, whatever camp you're in, I just want to offer a meditative reading of a poem this morning. Poetry, reading poetry is one of those spiritual practices that, that really speaks to me on my spiritual journey. And I want to read this poem slowly. Before I do it, I just invite you to take a few deep breaths. Maybe the deepest breaths you've taken all morning. And to relax. And as I read the poem from Denise Levertov, the poem is called The Avowal, I invite you to notice what stands out to you. The poem reads like this. As swimmers dare to lie face to the sky and water bears them as hawks rest upon air and air sustains them. So would I learn to attain free fall and float into creator spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. I just invite you to take a moment to just sit with those images. The poem is here on the screen. What stands out to you? One of the images that I'm always struck by is how, like water, the love of God bears us up. If we would only lay back, I ain't going to break my back up here, y'all, but if we would only lay back, Right? There's a vulnerability in these images, a risk even in these images, to allow ourselves to be held, to be sustained by the love of God. Now, of course, leaning into the love of God is not abstract. It involves trusting the wisdom of the way of Jesus with our very lives, which leads us to another dimension of abiding. Abiding in the Jesus involves embodying the teachings or commands of Jesus in our lives. And what are the commands of Jesus? I'm so glad you asked. Thank you for asking. They're summed up in love. Verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. There is this reciprocal relationship between the love of Jesus and the commands of Jesus. To be people who abide in the love of Jesus is to be people who love 
like Jesus. And how does Jesus love? Jesus is shown the way he loves earlier in chapter 13 as he washes the feet of his disciples, including one who will betray him. Jesus chooses love, not as an endorsement of the status quo, but as a kind of interruption to the cycle of violence. Abiding in Jesus is choosing love over hate, is choosing to build bridges rather than burn bridges. Abiding in Jesus invites us to the radical way of love, the power of love in a world of hate. Abiding in Jesus allows us to produce the fruit of love. And staying rooted in God, rooted in God as the source of love, allows us to love others without losing ourselves in the process. Still, this raises a question. How do we practically abide in Jesus? Now, as much as some of us type A folks like myself, might want it. Jesus doesn't give us a formula for how to abide. Jesus, why can't you just give like a formula, like three steps, a timeline, show us what kind of fruit will be produced? Jesus, Jesus isn't into formulas. The spiritual life cannot be reduced to a formula. Life is too complex and messy for that. And still, Jesus' words in this passage offer some general wisdom for abiding. And one way we abide in Jesus is engaging in these intentional rhythms or practices that open us to experience God's presence in us, around us, and through us. It's, as Dallas Willard would talk about, it's arranging our lives so that we are more at home in the fellowship of God. And his power, his life flowing in us, through us, living this eternal quality of life in the present as we anticipate the fullness of that in the world to come. Now, I'm curious to hear what kind of practices you might find helpful in your life of abiding. There are often some central classical practices, if you will, that are crucial. But our journeys are so varied and different than what it looks like for me to abide might look very different from what it looks like for you to abide. For some of us, abiding might look like setting aside regular times to center ourselves through listening to music, enjoying silence, or reading scripture alone or in community. For others, abiding might look like spending time with our unhoused neighbors, learning to see the face of Jesus in those we often know as the least of these. For still others, it might be paying attention to what falls in the room. cultivating an attentiveness to seeming distractions. For some of us, abiding might look like encountering the divine through delighting in nature, walking on the beach, participating in creation efforts to care for God's creation, all while remembering that God is a gardener. God has dirt underneath his fingernails and invites us to join in caring for God's creation. Abiding can't be contained in the box. The Spirit leads us in expansive ways to find ourselves more at home in the love, the peace, and the justice of God. I don't know about you, but when I look at our world, I see a world that is hungry, that is desperate for people who abide deeply in the reality of God. People who are deeply immersed in the love of God in ways that challenge the prevalence of hate. People that are so immersed in the joy of God that they refuse to give themselves over to the cynicism and despair of our world. People that are so connected to the peace of God that they are able to sustain their lives in the midst of the anxieties and the uncertainties of our times. My encouragement to you as we end. It's allow Jesus' words to be taken seriously in your life. Jesus says, abide, abide, abide. 
that you might find the life that is truly life and in all seasons bear fruit to the glory of God. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we are astonished at your invitation to find true life, real life, through abiding in you. May you allow us to enter more deeply to the life that you offer, that we might be people who bear fruit of love, of joy, of peace, and justice in a world of great pain. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who is our joy and our hope. Amen. Thank you so much, Trey, for that faithful invitation to abide, to remain, to be rooted in. Um, I invite you to stand in body or in spirit. We're going to sing a song, Joy of the Lord, and I liked that image of, you know, the boxing gloves, that the joy of the Lord is our strength, and, and it takes a little exercise of will, so let's put some will into this as, as we sing this song, but also if you need to lean on people in, around you, lean on your community, this is another opportunity um, to experience that reality that there are times when we can lean on each other. And if you need prayer, resident chaplain teams are available, I think, in each corner. Or, yeah, you'll find them. So uh, let's, let's respond in worship.
face who wipe every tear from my face joy this is the joy of the lord joy this is the joy of the lord oh joy this is the joy of the Amen. So a quick announcement, uh, just to remember you seniors to respond to the email that I sent you if you are planning on coming to the senior dinner chapel at my friend's estate on Thursday night. Make sure we order enough food. And now, tenemos un anuncio y benedicción en español de Izzy y Amiga. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chaney. I'm Kiki. And I'm Izzy. Um, last semester, we had the opportunity to be part of the West Mont Mexico Study Abroad program. Tonight, we're having an event where members from our team will be sharing experiences and stories that we learned from abroad. This event will take place in Founders at 5.30 p.m. and there will be tamales provided for anyone who wants to come. So hope to see you there. <laughs> and now for the benediction. In Spanish. Jehová te bendiga y te guarde. Jehová haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti y tenga en de ti misericordia. Jehová alce sobre ti su rostro y ponga en ti paz. Amen. Thank you.
just like you You're always surprising And if it feels too big to embrace Then it must be grace And if it feels too good to be true It's just like you Grace came running